The Jack Benny Program, presented by Lucky Strike. Six terrible diamonds. Let your own taste and throat be the judge. For smoothness and mildness, there's never a rough puff in a Lucky Strike. For smoothness and mildness, there's never a rough puff in a Lucky Strike. Yes, let your own taste and throat be the judge. For smoothness and mildness, there's never a rough puff in a Lucky Strike. And that's because LSMFT, LSMFT, Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. Fine, light, naturally mild tobacco that gives you smoothness and mildness. And no wonder, for years, Lucky Strike has maintained America's largest and most complete cigarette research laboratory. Prior to the auctions, the buyers for Lucky Strike send sample leaves from all tobacco growing areas to this great laboratory for scientific analysis to help determine which tobaccos are really fine. And this is only one phase of the constant research that helps make possible Lucky Strike's unconditional guarantee. Check the cigarette you are now smoking. Among all leading brands, only the makers of Lucky Strike put an unconditional guarantee on the pack. So smoke a Lucky. Let your own taste and throat be the judge. For smoothness and mildness, there's never a rough puff in a Lucky Strike. So round, so firm, so fully packed, so free and easy on the draw. Make your next carton Lucky Strike. <laughs> New York City, the Lucky Strike program, starring Jack Benny with Barry Livingston, Phil Harris, Rochester, Dennis Day, and yours truly, Don Wilson. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is our second week in New York. So let's go out to the Acme Plaza Hotel where Jack is staying. Our little star is still in bed. Boss! Boss, wake up! Mr. Benny, wake up! Huh? Oh, oh, it's you. Yes, boss, it's time to get up. Come on, open your baby blue eyes and look at me. <laughs> there. Now, here's your teeth. Smile at me. <laughs> I'm smiling, I'm smiling. What time is it? Four o'clock in the afternoon. Four o'clock in the afternoon? Didn't the sun shine today? I don't know. This room hasn't got a window. <laughs> what do you mean it hasn't got a window? Raise the shade. There, what's that? A picture of Central Park by Grandma Moses. <laughs> well, you could have fooled me. Yesterday when I lifted the shade, I could have sworn it was snowing. Uh, that was the plaster falling off the ceiling. Oh, yeah, look at the way it drifted up against the baseboard. <laughs> what a hotel. Rochester, you can stop laughing. This is a very nice... Hey, Bender, you want it on the phone. Huh? You want it on the phone. Hand me my robe, Rochester. Here you are. Okay, okay, I'm coming. Where's the phone? Right down the hall. And while you're talking, don't go tampering with a coin box. I won't, I won't. Yeah, I wonder who could be... Oh, here's the phone on the wall. Hello? Hiya, Jackson. It's about time you answered. Oh, hello, Phil. Did you have any trouble getting this hotel? No, I just dialed B-O-7236 and the Nairwick answered. <laughs> now, cut that out. What'd you call for, anyway? Well, look, we'll soon be going back to California, and I wanted to know if it's all right with you if Alice and I stopped off at Niagara Falls for a few days. Uh -huh. You know, that's the place to go for a honeymoon. Uh, Phil, you and Alice were married eight years ago. Didn't you go on a honeymoon then? Yeah, but this time we'd like to go without Remley. <laughs> Phil, you took Remley on your honeymoon? Didn't know it till we got there. Somebody tied him to the back of the car. <laughs> oh, well, that could happen to anybody. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Jackson, what? I got to tell you about a funny coincidence. Yesterday, Alice and I were walking down the street talking about a second honeymoon, and we ran right into the man that married us. Who was that? Petrillo. <laughs> Patrillo, how could Patrillo officiate at your wedding? Why not? My dues was paid up. <laughs> oh, oh, I see. Well, look, I gotta hang up now, Dad. I got a lot of things to do tonight. I'm gonna see South Pacific. South Pacific? You're gonna see South Pacific? Yeah. Gee, how I envy you. I pulled all kinds of strings to see that show. I couldn't even get one ticket. Really? I tried everything. Have you tried money? <laughs> 
Yes, I even washed Mary Martin's hair. Now, Phil, if you're stopping off at Niagara Falls, will you be back in Hollywood in time for my next Sunday's program? Sure, I'll be there, Jackson. You know I love you. Huh? Your option is coming up. I wouldn't let you down. <laughs> well, that's very thoughtful of you, Maestro. Goodbye. So long, Clyde. So long. <laughs> Who was it, boss? Uh, Mr. Harris. Well, I better get dressed now. Miss Livingston said that she might. Hmm, there's that dog in the next room barking again. Kept me awake half the night. I got a good mind to complain to his owner. His owner lives at the Sherry Netherlands. <laughs> The Sherry Netherlands? He only took a room here for his dog. <laughs> Fine thing. Imagine them putting a Cocker Spaniel in the next room. They tried to give him this one, but he, he wanted a window. <laughs> Afforded, why not? Rochester, hand me my tie, will here you? Here you are, boy. Come in. Well, hello, Mary. Hello, Jack. Hello, Rochester. Uh, hello, Miss Livingston. Yeah, don't be late there, right? <laughs> Hi, Miss Livingston. You know, Mary, when you said you might... <laughs> Wait till he goes to the races. <laughs> you know, Mary, Mary, when you said you'd come right over to this hotel, I wasn't sure that you would. Well, I have a confession to make. I only came out here out of curiosity. Oh. And, Jack, this Acme Plaza certainly is different. What do you mean, different? Well, I walked in the lobby. I asked the clerk for your room, and he said it was six floors down. All right. So, so you had to take the elevator. Some elevator. They lowered me in a bucket. <laughs> Mary. I got a picture of John L. Lewis in the lobby. Mary. And the bellboys are on a three-day week. Oh, stop. <laughs> Be happy you found the place. Do you have any trouble? No, I was lucky. I got in a cab and said, Driver, do you know where the Acme Plaza is? And he said, Yes, ma'am, I used to live here when I was out of work. Now I know you just made that up. <laughs> no, I didn't, Dad. Say, uh, uh, have you had your program all set for Sunday? Most of it, Mary, but I don't know what to do about a commercial. The sportsman quartet didn't come to New York. Oh, sir, you mentioned that yesterday, so I took the liberty to ask some friends of mine to come down and audition for you. Oh, thanks, Rochester. And you know, Mary, I thought that on the opening of the show, I might play my violin. I haven't done that yet in New York. Oh, Jack, nobody wants to hear you play Love and Bloom. Mary, I've learned a new one, Some Enchanted Evening. Wait till I, wait till I get my violin and I, I'll play it for you. Here it is, boss. Thanks. Oh, Mary, this will be swell now. Okay. Oh, wait a minute. Wait till you hear this. How do you like that? <laughs> hey, listen. There's another violinist in this hotel. That's the dog. He's playing at the palace this week. <laughs> no kidding. He used to be with a Met, but he had trouble with Rudolph Bing. Oh, oh yes, I read about that. Anyway, Mary, I'm going to play my violin in the program. It'll be very good. Okay, Jack, okay. Now, how about going out and get something to eat? We don't have to go out. We can eat right here. Jack, you mean you want to eat here in this room? Certainly. Rochester, get room service. Yes, sir. I'll put a note in the bucket and tell them to lower a waiter. Stop being funny. I don't care how you do it. Jack, there's so many nice restaurants in town. Why don't we go out? Mary, they have very fine food here. There's nothing wrong with this hotel. Maybe a little out of the way... What was that? Well, hello, Jack. Hello, Mary. Hello, Don. Don, I didn't expect to see you. How'd you know where I live? Why, well, I didn't. I was walking along the street and fell down an open manhole. <laughs> oh. Gosh, what a beautiful view of Central Park. Ouch! Don, what happened? I tried to stick my head out the window. Look, Jack, it's snowing. Yeah. Well, that must be the waiter now. Come in. Mr. Benny? Yes. 
Rochester told us to drop by. He said you were looking for a singing booth. Oh, yes, yes. Come on in, fellas. It was nice of you boys to come over. Uh, what do you call yourselves? The Ink Spots. The Ink Spots. Boys, I'm glad you're here. Rochester told me you had an idea for a number that could be used on my program. Yes, sir. We took our theme song and made a special arrangement just for you. Oh, how nice. Could I hear it now? Yes, sir. Well, sit down, Mary, Don. Come on, fellas, let's have it. If I didn't More than words can say If I didn't care Would I feel this way If this isn't love Then why do I thrill And what makes my head go round and round While my heart stands still If I didn't care Would it be the same? Would my every prayer begin and dim? With just your name And would I be sure That this is love Beyond compare Would all this be true If I didn't care for you Honey child, if I didn't care, if I didn't care what I smoked, baby, I'd smoke any kind of a cigarette. <laughs> but I do care, honey child. That's why I always smoke Lucky Strike. I smoke Luckies because they're so round, so firm, so fully packed. So free and easy on the door. And another thing, baby. There's never a rough puff in a lucky. <laughs> lucky strike. L-S-M-F-T. For the cigarette. L-S-M-F-T The very best That you can get All the one thing I'm sure That they're fine Beyond the compare Then this must be true Luckies are the smoke For you On the sea of pride is essential to success was really wonderful, boys. Absolutely wonderful. And rehearsal is tomorrow at 11 o'clock. Thank you, Mr. Benny. We'll be there. Goodbye. So long. Ah, <laughs> uh, you know, Don, the ink spots are going to be great. They sure will, Jack. Uh, what else would be planned for the show? Well, as I was telling Mary, I think that I ought... Oh, that must be the waiter. Come in. Room service. <laughs> Oh, 
yes, yes. Come in, waiter. <laughs> Mary, uh, what do you want to eat? Oh, I don't know. Uh, waiter, let me see that menu. Here you are, kid. <laughs> yeah, Mary, Mary, let me look at it. Now, let's see. Beef stew, wieners and sauerkraut, goulash, spaghetti and meatballs, porterhouse steak. Say, that's reasonable for a porterhouse. That's the old price. We had to raise it. Oh. How much is it now? Forty-five cents. <laughs> wow. Jack. Huh? Can't we go somewhere else? Don't worry about it, Mary. The food is fine here. Oh, all right. Waiter, have you any lamb chops? Yes, ma'am. Well, I'll have that, too. Oh, waiter, we'll all have lamb chops. Yes, sir. Would you mind saving the bones for the guests in the next room? <laughs> what? He always likes something to eat after his last show. <laughs> Never mind, waiter. Go get the food. Oh, say, Jack, you started to tell me something about the program. Oh, yes, Don. Now, look at it. Well, I was planning to play my violin. And then after the commercial, I thought we would do Allen's Alley. Allen's Alley? Yes, Mary, look. You see, Fred Allen has been off the air for nearly a year, and as long as we're here in New York, I thought it'd be a nice touch to bring back those wonderful people who lived in Allen's Alley. Oh, that's a swell idea, Jack. I'm glad you like it, Don, because I've already hired Kenny Delmar, Parker Fenley, Peter Donald. Well, so who's going to play the part of Fred Allen? I am, Mary, and you'll be Portland. But, Jack, do you think we can play those parts? Certainly, Mary. Look, here's exactly how it'll go on the program. Now, first, I'll put a clothespin on my nose like this. <laughs> now, wait, wait, wait till I fix it here on the nose. I have to, I have to sound like... Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> See? Mary, and then, and then you say... Oh, Mr. Allen! Mr. Allen! Well, Portland, gee... <laughs> well, Portland, I see you're reading the newspaper. What's new? Well, here's an interesting item in the personal column. A personal ad? Read it to me. <laughs> Two handsome young men with sniffles would like to meet two attractive young ladies with fever. Object to share four-way cold tablets. Gad, what romance. Come on, Portland, let's go down to Allen's Alley. And what is your question tonight? My question tonight is, do you think television will replace radio? Shall we go? As the man said when he stepped on his bathroom scales, I'm on my way. <laughs> well, things look kind of quiet here in Allen's Alley, but I think Senator Claghorn is home. I can smell the aroma of poached possum. I'll knock on his door. Somebody say somebody pitch a cotto with my pie. Yes, Senator. Big up, don't stand there spinning your pivot tooth. It makes me dizzy. Well, Senator. Get to the I... point, son. I'm busier than a bubble dancer with a slow leak. All right, Senator, but I'll I. Make it fast, son. I'm packing. Leaving for Florida, that is. Oh, is this your first trip? Son, I've spent so much time down in Florida, people think I'm Mayor O'Dwyer. <laughs> I know, I know. Well, you ain't laughing when you hear a joke you're supposed to yock it up. All right, all right. Now, look, Senator, I have a question I'd like to ask you. Do you think television will ever replace radio? Well, I don't know about that, son, but I do know that television will play a big part in the next presidential election. What do you mean, Senator? Well, now there won't be any campaign speeches in 1952. For the Democrats, Margaret will sing, and little old Harry will play the piano. 
I see. Yeah, and the, and the Republican. <laughs> the Republican. <laughs> They're going to make a song and dance team out of Taft and Hartley. <laughs> well, Senator, if television will play such a big part, who do you think will win the next election? Milton Berle. So long, sir. So long. So long. So long. Why, the Senator is a windy one. I'll pick up my hat and go next door. I wonder if Titus Moody is in. Howdy, Bob. Well... (laughs) Say, Titus. (laughs) Say, Titus, what's the matter? You look like you've been crying. All night long. Crying all through the night? What's wrong? Oh, my friend, Lem Hawkins. He up and died. Oh, that's a shame. When did Lamb die? Last spring. (laughs) Wait a minute, Mr. Moody. How come you're crying now if Lamb went last spring? He died during the planting season. I was too busy then. (laughs) How old was Lamb? Ninety-seven. Died of old age, eh? No, no, no. It was an accident. An accident? He worked over at the maple syrup factory. Yes. One day he slipped... Fell into a vat of maple syrup, sweetened himself to death. (laughs) No. Yep, yep. That was last spring. They're still fighting the ants off his grave. (laughs) Well, Mr. Moody, enough about the saccharine Mr. Hawkins. I'd like to ask you a question. Make it fast, bub. I got to go slop the hogs. <laughs> Mr. Modi, do you think television will replace radio? Why, no, no. The farmers, they'll never go for television. Why not? Well, sir, I bought a television set myself, put it in the hen house to step up egg production. And did it work? Well, first I tuned in the wrestling matches for them. That didn't do any good. It didn't? No. When gorgeous George come on, the hens would just sit there and pant. Uh Uh-huh. Then I tuned in Faye Emerson. Yes? I just sat there and pant. I see. Finally, I found the program that made the hens lay eggs. Hop along, Cassidy. How did Hoppy make those hands produce? Well, sir, every time Hoppy shot his gun, they'd lay an egg. No. Yep. It was a pleasure to watch Hoppy in a six-reeler. Him a-shooting and them a-laying. <laughs> so now you're prosperous. Well, no. I, uh, I would have been, but in one picture, Hoppy double-crossed me. Hoppy double-crossed you? How? Well, he pulled out a machine gun. All my hens dropped dead trying. (laughs) Well, I wonder who I'll find in this next house. It's good to see you again. The same to you, Ajax. But wait, you have a black eye. I have, I have, me boy. It is a badge of honor I acquired last night during a fracas at Kerrigan's Cozy Corn. You mean you were in a fight? Tell me what happened. I will. Last night, you see, I entered Kerrigan's Cozy Corn. A peaceful man. Uh-huh. With nothing on me mind but the delights of a tall, foaming glass of beer. Yeah. So I ordered me beer, you see. And over comes Kerrigan and questions me credit. I see. Well, when Kerrigan cast aspersions on me credit, we exchanged a few words. Uh huh. <laughs> then we exchanged a few blows. Uh huh. And Kerrigan started hitting me over the head with a bottle of four roses. <laughs> and what happened next? He switched to Calvert. <laughs> Well, 
Well, Ajax, the question I'd like to ask you tonight is, do you think television will replace radio? Well, now, me boy, that, that's a hard question to answer. Uh -huh. You see, in my house, we have both a television set and a radio. I see. And what do you listen to most? My wife. Goodbye, you boy. <laughs> brings us to the last little house in Allen's Alley. I wonder who we'll find here. Hello, Mr. Allen. Why, Mr. Kentor! <laughs> Tell me, Mr. Kitzel, what are you doing here in New York? Well, Mr. Allen, last week in Hollywood, uh -huh. I was walking down Sunset Boulevard, and as I passed a radio station, a man with a hook dragged me into a quiz program. A quiz program? Yeah, they asked me questions, I gave them answers, and the next thing I know, I'm spending two glorious weeks in the Bronx. <laughs> well, that's wonderful. Tell me, Mr. Kitzel, are you having a good time? Ooh, ooh, ooh. <laughs> Mr. Allen, every night a different show Really? What shows have you seen since you've been here? Oh, I saw The Rat Race, Death of a Salesman, Miss Liberty And last night I saw Max's Little Darling You be... You mean Texas, little darling? No, Max's little darling. I had dinner with my brother, Max's wife. <laughs> oh. Some little darling. She weighs 240 pounds. 240 pounds? On the present rate of exchange. <laughs> well, getting back to the original question, I'd like to ask your honest opinion. Do you think television will replace radio? For this, I'm in no position to venture an opinion. You're not, eh? No. I'll admit that I didn't rush out to, 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 to buy one. Uh -huh. Being very practical, I listened first to what people were saying about it, whether uh -huh. they were making them good enough and whether it was worth the investment. Uh -huh. And after debating to myself pro and con, yeah. I finally decided it was here to stay, so last week I went out and bought one. A television set? No, a radio. <laughs> Dad, what a display of confidence. <laughs> well, that's all I wanted to know. Goodbye, Mr. Kitzel. Goodbye, Mr. Benny. What? <laughs> With those blue eyes, you didn't fool me for one second. <laughs> well, thank you. So, you see, Mary, it'll be a cinch to do Alan Alley on the program. Let your own taste and throat be the judge. For smoothness and mildness, there's never a rough puff in a Lucky Strike, and that's because... LSMFT, LSMFT, Lucky Strike means fine tobacco. Fine, light, naturally mild tobacco. Listen to what Mr. B.V. E. Bowen, an independent tobacco buyer from Timminsville, South Carolina, recently said. At the markets I've worked as a buyer, I've seen the makers of Lucky Strike buy fine, light, ripe tobacco that makes a smooth, mild smoke. For 22 years now, I've smoked Luckies regularly. Millions of smokers, including the famous Shakespearean actor Maurice Evans, take a tip from the experts and smoke Lucky Strike. Just recently, the popular Mr. Evans said, I like Luckies better than any other cigarette I've ever smoked. And for your own real deep down smoking enjoyment, light up a Lucky. Let your own taste and throat be the judge. For smoothness and mildness, there's never a rough puff in a Lucky Strike. Get a carton today. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I just want to say we've had a very pleasant two weeks here in New York, and next week we'll be broadcasting again from Hollywood, California. Good night, everybody. Be sure to hear Dennis Day and the damn the life of Dennis Day. Stay tuned for the Amos and Andy show, which follows immediately. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.